Praise God. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. As David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is a, it truly is a blessing to be able to be here this morning, um, to be able to minister, to, to be able to, to, to speak of, of Christ and uh, to learn of Him and to get to know Him. And uh, even as Paul says, to know Him and to become like Him. Amen. And that's, that's, our, whole, that's our whole goal, is, is to know Jesus Christ and to become like Him. And that's why it's important for us as believers that we, uh, that we fashion our lives and we, after Christ and, and that we, we continually put ourselves there um, evaluating ourselves before the throne of God and before the cross because um, I want to know where I stand. You know, I, I want to know that I'm not, I, I don't want to be a, a, a person, a, a believer, a follower of Christ who, who's doing the least to get by. I, I want to know that I'm, I'm giving my, my all. Tozer was the one that actually said, you know, and, and I say this and <laughs> right up front, and I, and I know I'm, I've been, I guess, known for these kind of things, but uh, uh, he says, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. And, uh, and I was reminded of that even, even this past week, we were just driving and there's some, there's some beautiful songs out there and, and, uh, you know, when you begin to hear them, they grip your heart and, and, uh, just worship unto God and, and talking about the way that we would worship God. If, if, if we knew that he was behind the highest mountain, we would do everything to scale the mountain, to get across, to, to find him. If he was in the deepest valley, across the, the widest river, there, it, it would just, it wouldn't be that big of a task to find him. And then I, I just have to ask myself the question, then why don't we? And, and, and we, you see, we, we, we can say it in a song. It's easy to say in, 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 the, in the words when we're worshiping God, God, I give you everything. I, I, I give my life as an offering poured out to you. And the truth is, is, is take that self-evaluation. Do, do we? Am I giving, am I offering my life to Jesus Christ as a drink offering poured out before Him without reservation? And, and, and you know, when, when we hear the, the words and we're, we begin to sing the songs, it's like it pulls us and we gravitate towards that because we know that that's what's expected of us and we want to do it, but we, we often fall short of it. And so um, our whole life, though, is, is you know, Reaching forward, as Paul said, um, aiming at the at the mark, which is Jesus Christ and pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which you have been set apart for. Amen. You and I and we want to we want to know that we're doing everything that we can for the glory of God. Galatians chapter five. Um, you can stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter five. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and here's another way that we can uh, evaluate ourselves. And, and here's the important thing, is taking a real self-evaluation. It's not comparing yourself with, with anyone else around you. Uh, it is comparing yourself uh, with the Word of God. And, and, and the, the beautiful thing is, is you can always tell when you have improved. And, and there's a real measure there for you. It's not that I'm going to be everything by this afternoon and I'm not going to be everything by tomorrow, but, but I'm setting my goals and I'm setting my priorities because I want to become like Jesus Christ. And every day I want to be as that shining light that shines brighter and brighter under the perfect day. I want to become more and more like Jesus every single day of my life. And that's a real good measure. I'm not trying to compare myself with anybody else. I'm, I'm comparing myself with who I am and with, with, with me. And, and so I can tell you if I'm getting, I mean, I can be honest and say, hey, I'm getting better at this or man, I, I blew it. And, uh, and that's, that's what I want. My goal is to become more like Jesus. Um, Galatians chapter 5, starting with verse 22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for, for striving with us, for working with us, for challenging us, for helping us to see who we are. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to work in our lives and, and really bring to the surface the things that need to be, so that, Lord, that we can see who we are, where we're at, so that we can draw closer to you with, with, every, with every day, with every endeavor, with every step, that we can become more like you, Jesus. We know, Father, that it's so necessary for us to, to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives operating at work. And God, maybe today there will be some things that are revealed in, 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 in my life personally that I'm not living up to or that I haven't measured up to. And, and I'm going to ask you, Holy Spirit, to, to please help me to see these things so that I can become more like Jesus. I know, Jesus, it, it, it may be hard, it may be difficult for me to accept those things. It may be hard for me to even see these things in my own life. But I pray that you would help me to see them so that I can, I can begin to make corrections by the power of your Holy Spirit that's at work in me. And help me to be humble and, and willing to surrender under your mighty hand for the glory and the honor of your name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Praise God. We're so thankful again to be able to come into the house of God. And we know that it's amazing um, when we come in and, and we, we really want to know um, where we stand with God. You know, businesses do this. Often they, they will have just a, a self-examination um, process to where um, you, you have to evaluate yourself every so often, maybe every uh, quarterly or, or biannually or or whatever it may be, but they have these processes to where you can see where you were and where you are now, and because they're always wanting you to become better or more efficient at the things that you're doing, uh, just to see your own progress, because, because there's, a, there's a lot to be said that you, it builds confidence when you begin to see the, the, the progress taking place. And everybody, you know, everyone wants friends, everyone needs friends, everyone, um, everyone wants to, again, be better. We see this, there's so many uh, self-help books that are out there when we think about it, and some people, you know, they, some people think, well, say, well, you know what, I, I don't have any friends. Uh, well, the Bible says that we have to make ourselves friendly in order to, to have friends. Um, we, have to, uh, we, we have to present ourselves friendly, and, and all of us know people that, that it's, it might be a difficult task to do that. Um, hopefully it's not you, <laughs> um, but if it is, I pray that you know, today, uh, with the Holy Spirit's help and a little bit of humility, that we can come and, and learn a few things. But some of these books we, 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 we see that are out there is How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, why has it sold so many copies? The reason being is because everybody wants people to like them. Everybody wants, wants people to accept them. And, uh, and, and there are some things that as believers, the Word of God um, helps us and molds us and shapes us if we're, if we're willing to allow God to do this. Um, you know, the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto to you. And, and now that's, that's, that's a great... Um, that's a great scripture and a great command towards us. But as we've said in the past, sometimes I think that we, we look at it in just such a simple format and we think it and we take it to mean um, we just be kind to people. Which being kind to people is, is a good thing, right? I mean, none of us would argue in here that just being kind to people is a good thing, right? But, but what does it truly mean when I want others, when I should treat others as I want to be treated. It really means that um, I want people to help me. 
I want people that are around me that are willing to help me see who I am and help build me up. Not just merely to criticize me or to tear me down, but, but to really be there and, and give me some real advice in time of need. Because I, don't, I, 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 want, I want people to treat me as if I'm worth being treated respectfully. Do you get the picture? It doesn't mean just, just go along to get along. It means that we, we want people to treat us in a, in a way that is... I, I want people to treat me as a mature adult. I want people to treat me as I'm competent. I want people... And so, so how should I treat other people in the same manner? And, and so I, I want people to, I, I mean, if, like I said, if I'm in a, in, in a moment and there's, it's, there's something embarrassing and I don't see it, say you're walking out of the restroom again and you have something hanging out of your shoe, you don't want to just walk around all day with this thing hanging off your shoe. You want somebody to come up and say, hey, um, got something there. Or as we used to say, you know, a lot of times is, is, is and, I, and it's funny because I've said this to young people and they're like, what do you mean? It's like I say X, Y, Z. And they, do, they don't understand what that means. It means examine your zipper. <laughs> because you don't want to walk around all day with the, you know. And, and so you want somebody, so treat somebody the way that you want to be treated. Confront me in an embarrassing moment and, and, and show me. Help me to, help me to see where, where, I'm, where I'm wrong and don't, and, and don't do it in a condemning way. And this is, you see, we all want people around us to understand. And so we, want, we, need, to be, we need to treat people with understanding. We need to treat people kindly. We need to be gentle with, with others that are around us. And, and we're going to be talking about gentleness this morning. And, and what, is, what is gentleness? What is gentleness? And this is... This is pretty neat because uh, it, it goes hand in hand with meekness. And we're going to see that even more so today. But, but gentleness and meekness are interchangeable. It's based on the original Greek word used in the New Testament. And it, means, uh, and, and it literally means strength under control. This is what gentleness is. It's strength under control. And, and you know, I, I've, I've used this even in, for the word meekness. And come, you know, then you, you find out they're, they're one and the same. And it's, it's that stallion that is, that is beautiful. It is powerful. But a wild stallion is no good to anyone. But if you, if you grab that stallion and you can, what they call break him or meek him. What you do is you begin to make him gentle. It doesn't mean he's lost any of his strength. He's lost any of his power. He's just learned now to control it. And you see, we all, we, we all like to see people that have a good self-control. Right? We, we, I mean, you, we, we've seen people that are out of control and nobody likes to be around those people. It's just like, gather your wife and kids and let's go because this guy can go off at any time. Let's get out of here. Nobody likes to be around people. Somebody might have a family member that, that, that's that way and hopefully you don't have a spouse that's that way because, because it's not very pleasant to be around people that, are, that just fly off at the handle and you never know what you're going to get. But it, it means to be tamed. It means to have that power under control. It means to have all the same force and energy, but, but, but in a way that, that it is under your control. It doesn't mean to be weak. It doesn't mean to be wimpy. It, it it's, it's actually means to be very powerful. But to know how to use that power. The Bible talks of two people that were gentle or meek. And it's Jesus and Moses. And you can see that neither one of them, neither one of them were weak men. They were actually very strong. And, and, and I would dare say very masculine men. You know, I mean, you think of Moses and he sees one of the 
he sees his, his own people being uh, beaten and he goes and he takes the, he, he goes and fights with the Egyptian that's doing it. And we know the story um, basically finishes him and buries him in the sand. And, 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 and we see that, you know, he wasn't a wimp by any means. He goes and he finds himself in the desert um, before this well and there's these women that are coming up and there's this band of, of, of men that are coming to take advantage of and he's, and he's ready to stand up to all of them on his own and he's probably maybe also because he was trained under the Egyptian leader and authority to fight with his hands and he had the ability to inflict harm on people but the Bible says he's a meek man. So it's not weakness. And we see Jesus in the same sense. He's a carpenter. And it's not like carpenters these days that, that work with, with two by fours and things. No, you're talking about you cut the tree down. You trimmed it up. You made all the, you lifted it. You did all the work. And, and you had to work with your hand. It, 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 took, it took men to do this. And we see Jesus flipping tables over. And, and so it doesn't mean weakness. It just means that there is a strength that is under control. And so you and I have to be gentle. So Galatians tells us that one of the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is, is gentleness. In Philippians 4, in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Think about that. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Because the Lord is near. You see, gentleness is controlling your actions. In other words, you're not reacting to everything that comes your way. We, we've all seen people that just react to the things. They, they don't seem to ever have control of anything. It's just everything that comes there, they're reacting to it. But what a gentle person does is they choose their response. They choose the way or the manner in which they're going to respond to, to what is happening in the moment. And this is, why, this is why we condition ourselves. You think of a soldier who goes through boot camp, who goes through all the learning. What is he doing? He's, he's being conditioned so that when he's put in the middle of the situation, he doesn't do like a civilian that's never had that kind of training. All of a sudden a gun goes off or a bomb goes off and he's not, he's not flying off the handle and running in some weird... No, he, he knows what to do because he's been trained. And you get the same sense when, when the Bible's talking about us being gentle and learning to respond rather than react to the things that are going on around us. And so, I want to consider just a few different things that we can practice in our, in our day-to-day living so that we can learn to be gentle. Um, number one, be understanding. Be understanding, not merely demanding. See, when we come into contact with people, we have to be understanding. In Philippians chapter 2 and 4, it says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Man, that's a, that's a high order right there. See, that's what the Bible is full of. I mean, it's, it's always challenging me. It's always, it's always telling me where I, where I fall short, but it's always giving me the solution. And he says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Now, you before me. Think about that the next time that you go to work and somebody's, somebody's trying to get into that parking spot. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying after church when you get ready to go to that restaurant and you... Yes, I am. <laughs> you before me. Um, husbands, it's chivalry. Um, be kind. Put your wife first. Um, always, always try to, to put that, your best foot forward. Whatever you did to, to, to get her, God knows how you got her, but, but whatever you did to get her, keep doing it. Keep doing it. It's, 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 it's something that's needful. So how do, we, 
how do we respond when other people when 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 other people around you are maybe rude to you or are demanding of you? You see, remember every everybody around you is 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 going through something. Everybody has bad days. Not just you. See, this is part of that being gentle, being being meek is is understanding that that I, I I don't live by my feelings. I live by principle. Certain things that have been established in my life that that hey, these are the things that order my steps. These are the things that cause me to do what I what I'm supposed to do. Not merely my feelings. Not when somebody flies off at the handle at me. Um, you have bad days. They have bad days. Um, this is a moment that we look beyond our own needs. And we notice the needs of others. And we just, we just have to say, well, you know what? Maybe they're responding to me this way because there's something going on in their lives. Sure, there might be something going on in your lives and I'm not taking away from that. But it, but it may be a moment where you need to step back and say, hey, they're probably going through something. This is why they're responding this way because we understand hurting people hurt people. Right? We understand that. And so, so if, they're, if, they're, if they're lashing out, I think I should be the bigger person because, because I know better and I have the power of Christ that is at work in me. And, and what they're saying to me should not affect me. And we're going to get there in just a moment. It shouldn't affect me the way that it affects other people. And I should be able to respond differently because of the power of Jesus Christ that is at work inside of me. If it's really at work in me. So be understanding towards people. Second thing is be accepting. Be accepting of people. Don't always, don't always reject them just at first glance. Don't, don't just, hey, write them off. Because, because we've all been written off, I think. I know I, th- I think I've been written off more than once. And, and, and it doesn't feel good, right? Maybe you like it. I don't like it. But there's a, there's a time in your life when you, become, when you become confident in who you are in Christ. And then it doesn't, then it doesn't really matter as much. Because you understand who you are. Who you are. But, but don't just write people off. When a, when a per, person accepts Christ as their Savior, you know what, you know what happens as a result. They, they become a part of your family. They become a part of the fellowship because they're a part of the body of Christ. And the truth is, is that, that nobody's perfect. Uh, not even you. Maybe you. <laughs> I, I spoke a little bit about it on Wednesday. You know, there's, there's some people that think that they're, that they, they're, they're God's favorite and 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 the Bible clearly, you know, destroys that that thought, because the Bible, Paul uh, Peter says in, in in I believe it's Acts chapter ten. He says, "I've come to the place where I realize that God does not show favoritism to anyone. So don't think that you're going to get away with something that I can't get away with, and and don't think that anybody's getting away with it, and don't ever think that you're so loved by God that God's going to be God's going to let you slide with something He's not going to let anybody else slide with, but you for some reason are. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, we got to put it out there, right? But they become a part of the body of Christ, and none of us are perfect, right? So we've got to be careful how we treat other people. See, nothing feels worse than being rejected, and, and, and nothing feels better than being accepted. Romans chapter 15 and verse 7 says, Accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Hey, if God has accepted them, guess what? There's still some work He's going to do on them, um, but, but it doesn't mean that He called you to do the work on them. 
You may be there to help them and instruct them and, and to guide them, but man, you're going to have to show a lot of gentleness along the way. You're going to have to be very patient. You're going to have to ask God because in the process, what it's going to do is you're going to grow as they are growing. See, God puts up with a lot from, from each and every one of us. Our inconsistencies. Our weaknesses. I mean, I know you get it right every single time, right? Every time out the gate, you get it. You're, you're a hundred percenter. <laughs> um, I, I, I would like to be, but I'm, I can't say that I am. So we have to learn to put up with other people's shortcomings. Doesn't mean that we have to accept them. Doesn't mean that we, that we just sweep them under, but we have to see it for what it is and understand where they are in Christ. Maybe they're, they're not as mature at this point, but God is working on them. I can tell you this, you can, you, you can kill what God is doing in them. And Paul, will descri Paul describes this perfectly in, in the book of Romans, how you can kill what God is doing in them just by imposing your own. Thoughts and intentions. And you might be even doing it in the, with the right intentions, but you're not using the right methods to do it. And, it. and it can be very devastating to what God is doing in somebody's life. So whenever you feel tempted to call somebody out and call another Christian out, first think of, of, of your motive or your intentions behind and why Why do you want to call them out? Do you really care about them? Because, you know, all of us have people in our lives that, that, that we, have, we have, whether we realize it or not, that we have allowed to speak into our lives. And there, there are certain people that, that we have given the right to speak into our lives that can, that, that, that can honestly call us out. And usually it's those people that we know love us. They really love us. Because it's like they say, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And so what are the intentions behind why you're saying or wanting to call somebody out? And then, and then pause and remember what God has forgiven you of and, and what God has brought you of and how, how long has it taken for you to get to where you are? I know, I know that it can, we, we can become so stiff in this area that we think, we think a, a new believer should be right where we are by this time next week. And it's taken us 15, 20, 30 years to get to where we are. And boy, I tell you this, after, I, personally, after 30 years, God's, God's brought me a long way, but I can tell you this, He's still got so far to take me. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in your pastor here this morning. And I thank God that he's patient with me. He's, he's gentle. He has the power to crush me, but he doesn't. And, and he's working on me. So we have to be gentle with others and accepting of them. And not just merely rejecting them or writing them off. Um, and, and this goes right along with just be tender with them. Be tender with them. But, but here's, a, here's the thing is, is be tender with them. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you have, to, you have to surrender your convictions. By no means. See, when someone disagrees with you, um, we have to learn that we're never going to be able to get along with everybody. You know, there are just some personality types that you and I are just, we're going to, we're going to you know, conflict with. And, and this is an area where God needs to work with us in because, because uh, we, need, we need His Spirit and we need His mind. We need His heart. And so we're going to always meet people who like to argue. I, I mean, I think I met one person in my life. <laughs> it's probably me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we know, we know there's people that like to argue. Any, anybody, I mean, I mean, I'm not, just look straight, don't look to the left or to the right, but just keep your eyes right here. It'll keep you, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Um, one test of spiritual maturity is how do you handle people who just disagree with you? Huh. Huh. 
Think about that. People who just disagree with you, they rub you the wrong way, right? I mean, I mean, come on, how are you going to handle them? See, some people have a need to just, uh, to just shock and awe. They just, they just, they just have a need to, to, to somehow inflict a little bit of pain on you. Um, everything that you do, they challenge it. And they always have a, a comparison uh, to what you have. A complaint or a criticism. And, 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 they, and, and you might say something, they've just got an argument against it just for the sake of argument. I mean, it could be right. But they're playing devil's advocate all the time. And it's sometimes like, can you just stop playing dev- devil's advocate here? Can we, just, can we just, you know? So what do you do? You have three alternatives. You can retreat. You can attack. Or you can respond in gentleness. Three things that you can, three ways that you can respond to people. Um, and, and most people choose retreating or attacking. Most people just, you know, it, it's, it's easy. And sometimes it's the only option. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes the only option is walking away. All of us know people like that. My dad was one of those. There was no use in arguing. You could, you could have a pink elephant right here on the stage. and you could, If he didn't agree with you for whatever reason, you could tell him that's a pink elephant. And he'd say, no, it's not. He'd be looking right at it, and he'd say, that's not a pink elephant. Now, I don't, not that he was colorblind, <laughs> but he was just that kind of person. And I remember, even as a young believer, trying to witness to him, and, and I would try to tell him, Dad, the thing is, it's not, it's not a, according to your works. It's not according to what you've done. And, and I honored my father, and I'm not saying, saying it in, in any way to disrespect him, but... Um, I remember telling him, Dad, it's not according to what you've done. He says, no, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get in front of God one day and you're going to, you're, you're, he's going to say you did this good and you did that bad and this and that. And he didn't understand the concept. And he, says, and I've, and he, and he was a bricklayer. And he says, I've built enough churches, I'm in. Couldn't tell him about the grace of God. Couldn't tell him about the blood of Jesus Christ. Couldn't tell him about those things. It wasn't until later on in his life when, when, he, when he had several heart attacks. He had a double bypass, triple bypass, quadruple bypass. I think it was open like four or five times. So many times that, that on, on the last one it wouldn't heal. So they had to go back in there, cut it open, cut away the scar tissue and, and stretch the skin and sew it back together so it would actually heal. And he called me one day and he says... Um, and I knew something was different. And I just began to tell him. I said, Dad, I said, uh, and, I, and I knew and the Holy Spirit told me, this is the moment. This is the moment. And I remember I began to tell him, I said, it's, it's Christ that died for you. It was His blood that was shed for you, Dad. It's nothing that you've done. You can't get into heaven by those things. You have to accept Jesus. And, and I got to, and then I said, would you, do you want to pray with me? And he says, uh, yes. And he repeated with me, and, and I remember we, we had our time on the, on the phone, and, and he's passed away since. But I can tell you this, I, 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 I know I'll see him again, because he put his faith in Jesus. But, but had I been just argumentative with him, and, and just confrontive, and just con- continuing to, to play his game, it, we, we could have we gone two separate ways. But, you, but sometimes you just have to walk away. Don't get me wrong. There, there are those moments you just, you're, it, you're never going to get anywhere. But we give in to, to these things and we give in to retreat from people that, that want to argue and you say, okay, have it your way. And here's the problem with this because here's what we say, peace at any price. There's a problem with peace at any price because peace at any price brings many hidden costs in a relationship. In other words, I'm going to just peace at any price. I'm not going to deal with anything. And so there's going to be a lot of times in that relationship that things are going to come up. But you said peace at any price. All you've done is you've waved, waved the, the, the flag of surrender. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. On the other hand, you can attack and you can take the offensive and you can begin to fight with someone who opposes you. And, and attacking usually... Uh, is a, it's a telltale sign that, 
that you feel insecure or threatened by someone's disapproval? Why are you fighting? Why are you fighting? You, you have something to prove. See, anger is a warning light that tells you you're about to lose something. You're about to lose your temper. You're about to lose respect. You're about to, you're about to lose a friendship when you begin to just attack. See, there's the, when you begin to attack, you're not trying to resolve anything. You're actually just trying to win the fight and prove your point so that you can be king of the hill. I mean, how many relationships go through this? No, I'm going to prove to you that it, was, that it was your fault. Because that makes me feel better. I'm going to prove to you. We all know how that ends up. We all know how that works out in the end. It doesn't work out. All it does is makes the person that feels like they won superior to the other person. Oh, you really put them under your foot, didn't you? You really stomped on them. You, you really had your way with them. Boy, you're, you're, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're a champion. You don't feel that way, but, but, you've, but this, is, this is what happens. You're saying, Pastor, stop, slow down, calm down, Pastor. <laughs> See, when people attack, their most common reaction is to become sarcastic and attack another person's self-worth. We see this a lot in politics, but it happens in relationships. You're worthless. You're no good for nothing. Don't you realize it was you? Attacking the person's worth and, and making them feel worse so that you can feel better. And it's, and it's basically using them as a stepping stone so that you can get higher, you can have higher ground. God help us. God help us. See, these are things that we need to take self-evaluation of as we were talking about in the, in, in, when we were taking communion is, is take some self-evaluation of yourself and, and evaluate yourself of where you stand in, the, in this area of gentleness. Because this is a good moment to do it. The third alternative is to respond in gentleness. And this is the approach that, that, that God wants us to take in when, when, when we're facing whatever opposition or whatever it is that is confronting us or whatever it is that's coming against us. See, this kind of re response, it requires a, a balance. And, and it's a fine balance between maintaining your right to an opinion while also giving someone else the right to their opinion. It's not automatically, hey, you're wrong. It's, I want to hear what you have to say because maybe there's something I need to learn in this. Maybe, I'm just, maybe I've just not seen things the way that other people see it. Here we go. <laughs> it's a sign. For everybody who needs a sign, there it is. <laughs> It requires a balance. It requires being tender without surrendering your convictions. It's about to get dark in here. You can turn it off if you need to. Um, it requires being tender without surrendering your convictions. Romans chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, I want you to see this because this is very powerful. This is very powerful in the sense that, that this, is, this is a... An area of learning. Um, never think that you know it all. We all know those people, and we don't like to hang out with them. Hang out with them. We might like to sit back and watch them implode, but we don't like to hang out with them. <laughs> Romans chapter one. I mean, chapter fourteen, verse one. Chapter 14, verse 1. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and do not argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. 
Now, now it, 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 I, mean, I mean, pay close attention. This is one thing I've often said is slow down when you read the Scripture and think about what you're reading. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and do not argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. You know, often what I'll say is this. Is, and, and because some people say, well, well you know, um, when, when there's certain things in the Bible that, that they want to argue about. And it's like, and, and it and it's just doesn't really have a whole lot of bearing on, on, on your salvation. Uh, I'll, I'll, say, uh, I'll say something to the effect that um, this is irrelevant to my salvation. So what's the big deal? It, it doesn't, it doesn't, don't, don't get so dogmatic over every little detail like how many, well, when was the flood and, and when did it take place and, and, and how many people and this and that. And, and you can get over fighting over little things and it's like it's irrelevant to my salvation. I don't, I don't need to argue over these things. So he says about what they think is right or wrong. And, and notice how he says about what they think is right or wrong, meaning it's, it's, it may not be right or wrong, but they don't know that yet. They're, they're, they're not there yet in their walk with God. He says, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believes with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. And boy, they'll preach that to you. I'm sorry if you're here. And, um, love you. Hope you love me. Um, he says, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. For God, and, and here's the important part, for God has accepted them. Oh my. Now there's something to contend with. God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive His approval. Man, man, that, I, I don't know about you, but that is powerful. And, and, and this scripture, this, this chapter right here, it's, it, it can be very controversial to people who are stringent. And, and boy, I tell you, don't read it if, if, you're, if, if you're not ready for it. In the Message Bible in Romans chapter 14 verse 1 it says this. It says, welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the same way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions and weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with them. To deal with, treat them gently. Huh. Treat them gently. And then Proverbs carries it up and follows it up in Proverbs 15 in, in verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So, so you have in your, in your control the, 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 the power to, to, to heat things up or you have the power to kind of, kind of you know, bring that thing down. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And, and, then it's, and then it's, are you putting others before yourself? Are you thinking of them before you? Are you, are you, are, are you just there to fight and get your own will? He's, you see, I'm sure we found this to be true in, in, in our experiences. I know that it, I, I've seen this. That you can respond in one way. You, you, can, you can respond. And when somebody responds to you arrogantly. And they want to challenge you on every single thing. It, it, it turns you off, but, but you can respond quietly and say, hey, you know what? Um, this isn't time or place. This is no big deal. James chapter 3, look at what it says. James chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, Reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. I mean, I mean, 
Pastor didn't tell you that. Uh, James did. See, James, he points out the cause of quarrels, arguments, is, and he says it's selfishness. Wanting our, our own way and, and imposing, it, imposing, imposing it on others and demanding that others agree with us and see things our way because this is the only way, right? But he goes on to say that wise people are peaceful, pure, gentle, and, and friendly. You see, as I said, all of us know a know-it-all. And, and, and nobody, nobody really likes to be around people that are know-it-alls because, first of all, they can be obnoxious. They're not friendly. They're not peaceable. Um, and, and, and most, they're not gentle. And they're just trying to impress everyone that's around them with their knowledge. And, and it, it, it somehow makes them feel superior to everybody else. And it's, and it's not a good thing. See, gentleness is the ability to just disagree agreeably. It's, it's, hey, we, we don't have to see things eye to eye, but we can still be friends. See, you can, we, we, can, we can still be friends and, and, and hey, it's okay. It's okay. I, I understand. I, I think I understand where you're coming from. I don't completely see it the way that you are, uh, the, the way that you see it. But, but hey, we can, let's, let's move on. Paul writing to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 says this. In verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. But notice it doesn't come when somebody's arguing. It doesn't come when you're trying to prove your point. It doesn't come because you're hanging around your friends and you want them to see that you had the right answer and that you won the argument. And that's, I mean, I mean, didn't. And then you, you can go home and you can sit down on the couch with your friends and you can say, hey, didn't you see the way I answered so and so? And didn't you see that I was superior to him? And didn't you see that I could I could outwit him? And didn't you see that every time he brought this up and said this, boy, I was mm, man, I'm, I'm good, aren't I? That's, that's just ugly, if I can be honest with you. And that's not being gentle. Yeah, you got your point across, but you probably lost somebody for the kingdom. You probably just turned somebody away permanently from the kingdom of God because they saw you and they said, that's what Christ is, I don't want anything to do with him. Be understanding, not demanding. I understand we have, we have principles to uphold. We don't surrender our values. As I said, we can, we can agree to disagree. We don't surrender our values. Fourth thing is be teachable. Be teachable. When someone corrects you or me, uh, be teachable. James 1.19 says, So then, my brethren, beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. See, if, if you're quick to listen and slow to answer back, you're going to be slow to, to, slow to, 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 to put on your temper. Slow to react. And, and, and you have to be a gentle person. And a gentle person uses their ears more than they do their mouth. I've heard it said that that's why God gave you two ears and one mouth. Listen more, speak less. Listen more, speak less. Anybody who's married has learned this lesson. Listen more, speak less. Ah. Some of you still need to learn it. Listen more, speak less. Your wife says something to you, she doesn't want an answer. She just wants you to listen. Listen more, speak less. Don't tell her how you can work it out and you can get it done in 15 minutes. And if you just tell so and so this, it'd be. Not looking for that, buddy. Just, just listen. 
The Greek word translated again, gentle, is, is meek. People don't like this because they equate meekness with weakness. But again, Jesus calls himself meek. And, and then he says in Matthew 5 and 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And the meek, the gentle, will inherit the earth because this is the kind of people that God is after. He wants people who have self-control. He wants people who have, who have strength, who are strong. I, I, I want to I emphasize this. God wants people who are strong. He's not looking for, for wimps. Anybody who's been a believer, a true believer for any amount of time understands that, that this, is not, this is not for wimps. This is not easy. He's looking for people that are strong. That's why the Bible says, and there's some criteria to make it into the kingdom of heaven. And you know what one of them is? Is cowards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So you, we, we, we've got to be strong. We've got to be strong. And so, so people don't like to think of meek. But Jesus says the meek are the ones that are going to inherit the earth. They're, they're, they're the people that are strong. But they, but they have their strength under control. They know when to use it. And they know when to withhold it. They know how to handle the things that God has given them. They have, they have understood the tools. And they, and they know how to wield these things. You know the, the word of God is, is powerful. It's a double-edged sword and you better know how to wield it because you can kill somebody with it or you, can, or you can bring them back to life. You better know how to wield those things. See, meekness is a mark of confidence. It's a mark of maturity. That's, that's what being a parent is, not, not a friend. I'm sorry, sorry, parents, for those of you that want to just be friends and not a parent. It's knowing how to use the authority that God has given you over your children, but not abusing the authority because the Bible says, children honor your mother and father, but it also says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. In other words, in other words don't, don't, you better know how to wield that, that authority that God has given you. That's why we always looked at our girls and we said, hey, you know what, this is, you know why you're getting in trouble. And we'd explain it to them, this is why you're getting in trouble. Do you, now, do you see why? And they would say, yes, we see why, we understand why. Not just, it, it wasn't always because I'm your father and I, that's, what I say goes. Now, there's, there are moments for that. But those are far few and in between. Those are moments that you need, you need to exercise that kind of authority in a moment. When your child's about to enter into danger and you can use that authority and stop your child right in his tracks. You can say, hey! And your child... Because they knew that mom or dad was, was serious in that moment. But if you're always doing that, they, they, they're not going to respect you. So don't misuse or abuse the authority that God has given you. But meekness is a mark of confidence and maturity. It's, it's the person that's able to say, hey, I, I know who I am in Christ and I don't have to argue and I don't have to be angry at people and I don't have to treat people unkindly and I don't have to, to treat them in a disrespectful way. I know who I am in Jesus Christ. It's when people come against you and speak all kinds of evil against you and you don't have to return evil for evil because because. You're confident in who you are. And finally, learn to be proactive, not reactive. You want to come? Learn to be proactive and not reactive. The Apostle Peter talks about a time when Jesus was before Pilate. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Bible says, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. See, Jesus was on trial. 
And Jesus himself said it. And he says, I could, have, I could command 12 legions of angels. You and I don't even understand the devastation that could, could come as, as a result of that. When you think of, when you think of the, the plagues against Egypt, and because Pharaoh didn't want to let the, the, God's people go, and one death angel, one death angel came to visit that land that night, took every firstborn. When David had sinned and, and uh, he had numbered Israel, God sent one angel, one angel, and, and slew over 130,000 people. And, and that's when David made, made the altar and the threshing floor of Ornan. And, and he was ready to give it. David said, I'll, I'll take nothing. I don't want to, I'll take nothing that, that costs me nothing. I'm not going to offer God something that didn't cost me. Maybe, maybe somebody needs to hear that. Your faith is going to cost you. So David says, David says, and he's and, and, and David is, I, I can guarantee you at this moment, David is terrified in his flesh out of his mind. But he's got to be courageous. Because he's not coming up against a lion. He's not coming up against a bear or even a giant. He's coming up against God himself. And he offers the sacrifice and, and asks for forgiveness. And, and, and David puts himself there on the line and basically tells God, he says, the next one to go, me. Don't take another soul. Basically looking at God and saying, over my dead body will another one die. And the Bible says this, this angel was standing there with his sword drawn. And I just get the picture of this powerful angel standing there with his sword drawn and blood dripping from his sword. Just waiting for his, for his next uh, order from the Father. And David is standing before this angel, knows that he's no contest, he's no competition to this angel. And he says, the next one to die will be me. And David writes, you de you, he delivered me because he delighted in me. So Jesus says, I could, have, I could call 12 legions of angels. In other words, I could, I could clean this world off in, 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 in the next second. Every human being gone. Jesus had the, all the power and all the authority of heaven and earth. He had all power, all authority. And he could have used it, but, but he sheathed his sword. And he offered himself as a living sacrifice for you and for me. He didn't act or he wasn't reacting to what was happening to him there at that moment. He was being obedient, following through with orders. I I remember I was I was thinking about this just about a month ago and I was thinking about meekness and and I thought what 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 one statement could could define what meekness is? And that is your will, not mine. And that's what Jesus was saying every step of the way. Your will, not mine. Remember, he said, if there's any other way to do this, um, let's do it. And he says, but nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. That, that, that's meekness. And then you have to ask yourself, when Pilate was standing before him and says to Jesus, he says, you, you know, just tell me and I, don't you know that I have the power to save your life? Think about, think about who was in control of the situation at this moment. Think about who was in control of the situation. You talk about, you talk about psychological dynamics and, and, and whether you're confronting or, or, or facing or, or, or contemplating Pilate was threatened by the fact that Jesus wouldn't say a word. Don't you realize that I have the authority to save your life? And 
You don't have such authority, Pilate. I can only imagine what Pilate was thinking at this moment because he didn't want Jesus to be crucified. But I think deep down inside, he knew that he couldn't stop it. But he was just, he was just thinking that I could, if I can just get it out of him. And, and Jesus said, you don't have that kind of authority. The only, authority, the only one who has that authority is my father. I can imagine Pilate as he's sitting there nervous and Jesus doesn't respond to him. And, and by choosing not to respond, he took authority back over. He took authority over the situation. You see, it's when somebody comes to you and is, is very combative and, and, and wants to pour it out on you and tell you all the reasons why. Sometimes the best thing to say is, to say nothing at all. Because when you respond to them and you say, well, why do you always... What you've done is you've just handed your authority back over to them. Because in that moment, they realize that when I say this, I can control your emotions. I can control the way you think. I can control the way you feel. I can control these things. And sometimes when you just say nothing at all and you say, I have nothing to say. In other words, you keep your peace. You keep your strength. And you, and you sheath the sword. Just put it, put it away. I'm not here to, to prove anybody, to prove anything to anyone. See, it's hard when somebody begins to respond in a hurtful way. It's not, it's not easy. It's not even natural to respond in a, in, a, in a simple way, in a peaceful way. What we need in that moment is we need the supernatural power of God operating us in us. Through the, through the fruit of the Spirit to help us to respond in a way that, that is honoring and pleasing to God. Would you stand? See, the next time somebody tries to come at you or backstab you or talk behind your back or say something and don't react. Don't react. Don't, don't, don't. Don't give them the power. Don't give them the authority. Remember this. No one can take the control from you. You'll have to give it to them. Nobody can, nobody can take that from you. Romans 12, 17 says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. And then in verse 21 it says, And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, this is the power of God in your life. And, and I love this because the way that Jesus responds to these things is the fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness. Meekness. Not, not with force, but with spiritual authority. Choosing how we Respond. Proverbs 16.32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit is better than he who captures a city. You see, after all, we are not here to represent ourselves. We are here to represent Jesus Christ. And when I react in a situation, who am I representing? But when I think about it, pause and respond correctly. It's in that moment that I say, you know what? This, this is bigger than me. This is not about me. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if I react, I get the glory. If I pause and respond, He gets the glory. Don't allow Satan to take that, that power and that authority and, and don't give that authority over to anyone. 
they don't deserve that kind of authority in your life. You know, the only person I was listening, my wife was actually listening to some to a preacher this past week. And and I heard that kind of response. And and he, he was basically saying there are those they want to have authority over everyone else. When truly the only person you actually have authority over is yourself. So they want to control the people that are around them rather than controlling themselves. And when you don't respond, and when you just, you don't give them that authority, it, may, it, it might make them mad. And that, that might be a moment that you need to walk away, but um, don't give anybody that authority. Because once you give it to them, it'll be so difficult to take it back. Maybe you're here today and And uh, some things in your life that you're just like, hey, you know, self-evaluation, Pastor. I've been blowing it. I've been missing it. And uh, you're in good company. You're in good company because we all miss it. We all blow it from time to time. Um, Good thing is, is we get to take self-evaluation and get back on track. And that's what the Spirit of God is here to do. And to help you do this morning, you and me, is to get back on track. To keep fighting the good fight. Get back in the fight. Run the race. Run it with endurance. Run it with patience. Be gentle. Maybe that's you here today and I want to pray for you. I believe that God has something for you. I believe that, that, that there are some things maybe in your life that need to be surrendered to God. And what better place to surrender them to God than right here in God's house? You want to come, Jackie? I want to. I do. I want to open up the the altars just for a couple minutes, and maybe there's something that you want to come and lay down before before God this morning, and and just surrender it to God. Let it be. Let it be in this moment. Father, you see us, you know us. God, we haven't always responded correctly or adequately. Maybe there's maybe 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 God, we haven't been as gentle as we should. And Lord, through this process of learning the fruit of the Spirit, um, it's been a real eye opener. And I've realized that there's some areas in my life that are that that just need some work that maybe I've neglected. That I need your Holy Spirit because I can't do it on my own. I don't have the power. I don't have the strength to accomplish these things. But I need you, Holy Spirit, right now. Thank you, Lord. Maybe I haven't Maybe I haven't been the person that I, that I want to be, that I want you to make me into, God. Maybe it's, there's some hurts in your life, some things that, that have happened to you that, that, that you put up some walls and some things and, and you're just like, God, I, I just, I don't think I can... I can't do this on my own. I I just need some real help. I can tell you this. Not only will the Holy Spirit come and help you in your life. There are other people that are in this room that want to pray with you. What I'm going to ask is, is I want you just even even right now, just just, hey, I'm letting it down. I'm letting it down. You know, we always want to come to the altar many times and 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 yet. We miss these opportunities. I don't want you to miss an opportunity this morning. I don't want you to miss an opportunity. Hey, this is a moment where, hey, I'm, I'm just surrendering, God. I'm surrendering, God. I, I'm admitting to you that I don't have it all under control. I'm admitting to you that, that I still need a lot of work done in my life. I need some help. I need your strength this morning, Holy Spirit. 
if that's you, I want you just to come up as they, as they begin to worship. And, and we're going to have some of our leaders get behind you and just pray with you and, and, and encourage you in, in, the, in the strength of Jesus Christ and in the power of Christ. Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful, God, for, for your word. That God, that you haven't, you haven't left us helpless, but God, you've given us everything and so much more that we need, Father, so that we can live our lives, God, with the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit. That God, that we can look at each day, Father, as an opportunity, Father, of, to, to bring glory and honor to you, Father. And each day and every opportunity, Father, is a moment to, to experience the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. I pray that, God, that we would, we would just look to you and put our trust in you, Father, and, and see, God, with, with eyes, Father, unveiled, unveiled, your presence and your power, your presence and your power, your presence and your power, your presence and your power. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, God in Jesus mighty name. I I wanted to read just something I, I, I took note of and it's just a quote. Um, Dane had given me a book called The Indian Road or the Christ of the Indian Road. Yes, the Christ of the Indian Road. I even wrote the title down and I didn't read it. <laughs> I, I, I love this perspective on it. Uh, just you know there's a lot of great things you can pick up but there's some things and, and it may be even one statement out of a book or one statement um, and but it just speaks so deeply to you and this this just is powerful he says um, I suggested as he well knew and practiced in a wonderful way that there is a third ideal of life namely the cross and I love this he says now the cross never knows defeat for it itself is defeat. And you cannot defeat defeat. You cannot break brokenness. It starts with defeat and accepts that as a way of life. But in that very attitude, it finds its victory. It never knows when it is defeated. For it turns every impediment into an instrument and every difficulty into a door, every cross into a means of redemption. So I conclude, any people that would put the cross at the center of its thought and life would never know when it is defeated. It would have a, a quenchless hope that Easter morning lies just behind every Calvary. It reminded me of something Brother Clendon and said when he's speaking about Paul. He says, Paul was a dead man on furlough. You can't kill a dead man. He doesn't know when he's defeated because that's what the cross speaks of. And from that moment, all there is is hope. Amen. All there is is hope as we move forward. And thank you for being here.